I'm committed to those people who feel worthless each year, who are failed by these two-week diet plans each year, the people who, who wreck their self-esteem, who can't stand to look at themselves in the mirror because of how they perceive their identity is wrapped up in the amount of fat they have. I'm hoping to reshape their view about weight loss, about health, but also reshape their view about themselves. I think th there's an audience out there who think that health and actually weight loss is about deprivation, punishment, restriction. And I wanna share with them, number one, it's not their fault. They're not broken. They don't lack willpower. I wanna share with them that actually regaining your health, losing excess weight, if you want to do it, is about compassion. It's about fun, it's about enjoyment, it's about self-esteem. So look, you know, here we are at the end of 2020. Um, we've had a few of these conversations <laughs> over the last few years. And, you know, I know one of the things I always ask you is what you think you're going to be doing this time next year, but we'll come back to that. But what are your reflections so far on, on 2020? Yeah, so I think 2020, for me, I think like many of us, if I'm honest, has has caused quite a bit of introspection and kind of looking at our lives, assessing our lives, figuring out what we want more of, what we want less of. Uh, and I don't think I'm any different there now. I think it's it's always important to say that for me, that that everyone's got a different experience, right? So um, I've been in the very fortunate position where I can reflect on certain things. Whereas I think for many people, it has been really, really stressful from a you know financial stress, economic stress, worrying about relatives, or maybe someone's been sick in their family. But for me, I think this year has caused me to pause and reflect on my values in a way that I don't think many years have. You know, I feel I have been getting quite introspective over the past few years and um, really trying to ask myself who I am, what kind of life am I living? Is it in alignment with who I want to be? But I feel 2020 has been, um, you know, personal growth on steroids. I think the pressures that we've all faced have really started to expose what I call fault lines. So I kind of feel that 2020 has exposed in many of us things that were already there, but actually our day-to-day -day lives weren't stressing us enough for them to be exposed. And I feel some insecurities that I may have about who I am, um, thinking about what other people think of me, um, but also how I'm living my life, I think have been things that I've been thinking about a lot. Mm. Um, a, a key moment for me was in the summer, actually. In August, I went off social media in its entirety for 18 days. And I hadn't planned to go for 18 days. Like I'd planned to maybe, I don't know, do a week, 10 days. I, I do this periodically. And it just felt so good that one week became 10 days. It became 14 days. And before you know it, at 18 days, I was thinking, oh, I quite like not being on social media. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of those big, that two big things happened for me. Once I'd got out of the habit of picking up my phone and trying to find the Instagram app, which I had deleted, and that took four or five days. That's a biggie, isn't it? Deleting Instagram. Yeah, but it's amazing to see just how habitual that is. So you pick up your phone and you're looking for an app that's not there. It's like a ghost. There. And, and, and it took a good five days for that to go. But I felt that what that gave me was silence. Like I felt the, the, the volume on life suddenly got turned down. And I felt that I started to tap into what I really think. Uh, what I mean by that is often because the first thing we do, we go online, we follow our 
influencers, we we go on Twitter, we we read other people's views on things. And I don't think many of us realize, including myself, how much our worldview is influenced by other people. And when I had that silence, when I wasn't going on any social media platform at all for 18 days, I started to, it started to come up in me what I really think, not what everyone around me thinks. What do you really think? Is the, is the societal view the same view as you have? Or is it a bit different? Um, so I think a lot of introspection for me. I mean, what about you? Mm. What have you learned this year? Yeah, very similar. I mean, I, it was, uh, you know, I think you're right about self-exploration and what you're talking about in a way are thresholds, aren't they? And your threshold for, you know, your habits and, you know, faults and things that kind of that we, we do. We have to all take stock again of what we do and why we do it. And I think for me, you know, work's just been so busy for obvious reasons that's predominated but there was some time to slow down which I think has been has been really nice um what interests me is what you said about values because to me that means you know I, I always think of core values like um contribution or recognition or adventure what what do you mean by values so you obviously sort of it sounds like you've had a year of learning a bit more about yourself yeah, look, it, it, it's been a busy year in many mm. ways. Um, there have been all kinds of pressures this year, which we can talk about. But in terms of that question about values, it was it was in that time um, when I went off social media that I, I started to list out, I tried to write down what are my core values? What are the values that I think I live my life by? Or I would like to live my life by. And that's, I think, the, the funny thing with value sometimes is that sometimes we think, oh, I value hard work, I value family, I value, um, you know, success, whatever that means. But then if you actually look at your life, you go, well, are my actions really consistent with that? Mm. So is it a real value or is it an aspirational value? And what I try to do is kind of figure out what are my ideal values. And I've, I'm still playing around with it. I think it's a great exercise for people to do, but, you know, integrity is one of them. So it was integrity. Uh, compassion um, was another one. Family. Hmm. Solitude. These are four of the values I put down. And then it was a kind of a case of looking at, am I living my life by those values? You know, so am I, do I have integrity in everything I do? You know, am I being completely honest, transparent in my personal life and my professional life? So I, I sort of go through that process. Uh, compassion, that's compassion to other people, uh, but also compassion to myself. Am I living my life in accordance with those things? Um, you know, uh, family, one of one of the you know one of the big things I'll be thinking about this year, and it relates to values, is this idea of what is success. You know, what, what is success? I I, I think I think so many of us never take the time to define what success is. So we're chasing this mythical idea of success without actually knowing what does that mean. I agree. Yeah. You know, and it, we're letting society defines success for us. And if we let society define it for us, it's often things like, um, you need to earn more money. You need to go on nicer holidays. You need to have the car that your neighbors got. Um, you need to get your kids into a certain school, right? It's, it, you, you know, you, we're being sold that we're not enough, that, oh, I could look better if I bought that new t-shirt or I got the latest smartphone or I, you know, it, it's this kind of capitalist society where we're constantly being marketed to buy, 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 because we are not enough in who we are. And I think a really valuable exercise that I've been doing this year is, well, what is enough? What, what, what does success look like for me? You know, what if we as a society define success and not by your job title, or the amount of money you earn, or the kind of holidays you've got, what have we defined it as how many meals did you have this year with people you really value? How many meals did I have this year with my children and my wife when I was present 
and not distracted. You know, because if you take the time to define that, then you'll have a good idea of whether you're meeting it. Because maybe mm. some of us have already reached our definition of success, but we've never taken mm. the time to look at it, measure it, assess it. So we keep chasing, we keep feeling that we're not enough, that we've got to do more. But it's that question for me that keeps coming up. And I, I would, I'm constantly asking myself this. And I hope by us having this conversation that other people ask themselves this is, what is enough? Yeah, I, I, I totally relate to that. And I think, um, you know, we're chasing something that's unrealistic and doesn't exist, you know, and, and it takes, it suddenly dawns on you, doesn't it, that actually there is no end game here. You've got to actually stop and, and think about what you're doing. But what I would say about you, you know, as a, as a, a mate of yours and as someone that looks at what you're doing from the outside world, I think your purpose is pretty clear. You know, you, you've, you've made it explicit that you want to help 100 million people, you know, and a lot of people listening to you talking about about yourself would be surprised because they'd think, well, hang on, he's got that sorted. He's got a very clear mission and he seems to be doing it. So what's the problem? Yeah, I mean, on that, so one of the most powerful moments for me, certainly on this podcast this year, was when I spoke to Matthew McConaughey a few episodes mm. back. And I don't know if you remember that conversation, but you know Matthew's arguably one of the most famous actors in the world, mm. uh, an Oscar winner. I've heard um, of him. <laughs> and there was a moment in the conversation where I asked him, "What do you struggle with? You know, what's the the character trait that will rear its head?" when pressure comes into your life, when you're not sleeping enough, when you're being pulled in too many directions, what's that mm. that flaw, if you will, that we all have that keeps coming up? And he paused because I don't think he'd have been asked that question before and he was really thinking. And must be five, six seconds later, he said a lack of confidence. And for me, that was one of the most powerful moments that I've had on the podcast this year. Um... To, to, to understand that actually even someone who is regarded as successful, whether it's money, Oscars, you know, movie star, everything that society would define as success, he probably has. Yet he says he suffers from a lack of confidence. I think that's powerful. And, and relating to that to your question, if people do look up to me and think that I've got it all sorted, um, what I try and share week in, week out on this show is that that's not the case. You know, I am like everyone else. I'm just a perfectly imperfect human being who has my own struggles and challenges. And, you know, there's, as, you know, as my profile grows, which is happening at a huge pace, I mean, that's some of the goal for me. The goal is to make an impact but the side effects of impacting more and more people is more and more people know who you are. And with that, if you're not careful, can come a real external pressure. And, you know, I've got this old swing fault or characteristic trait of being a people pleaser. And I've realized that you can't please everyone. The quest I'm on, and I think that's been magnified this year is how how do you be completely authentic and sincere with who you actually are? Because I can do my job best, whether that's my job as a doctor or my job as a husband or my job as a father or my job as a son or my job as a friend, right? I can do all those jobs best when I'm being more authentic, mm. you know? And that, that topic has come up a lot in the last few months on the podcast. How can I be the same person off the mm. mic mm. as I am on the mic? I know what you mean. We've got no game face. There's you no know, mask. What, yeah. 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 How, how yeah. can I keep taking the masks off? Because that does two things, I think. A, I think that's, that's what true connection is, mm. right? You can't connect when you're performing. You can't, well, you can't truly connect. I want to speak to Pippa Grange a few months ago. And she said one of the most wonderful phrases that I've heard, which is, are you performing at life mm, or are you mm. really living life? I think it's mm. super, super powerful because it, it's, 
I feel that that sort of um, widespread yeah. revolution actually starts with personal revolution. As yeah. I feel if I can get clearer on who I am, if mm. I can look in the mirror each day and be happy with the person that's looking back at me, I think all the roles mm. in my life, I can do a lot better. Mm. It's, I, I, I get that and I totally agree. I mean, it's, it brings me on to kind of your podcast, which is, you know, for me, the kind of um, your opus in some ways in terms of the core of, it's at the very core of what you do. And I've noticed it's changed a bit this year. Um in terms of you know partly the format there are these bite-sized bits which i love um and also the the array of guests is is really broad now isn't it yeah i mean i think you know we're coming into the podcast being three years old it's mm. a few weeks away from its third uh third birthday so <laughs> um you know it's changed from being an audio production to being now audio and video mm. um you know I, it's gone from being, you know, me chucking a couple of mics in my backpack and trying to find people in their offices or wherever they are. It's actually having a studio now where I can actually, you know, that, I, that we can really own the space. Hmm. But I think the evolution of the podcast has really just reflects on my own personal evolution. And I, I've been thinking about this and I, and I sort of think this is one of the reasons why it has become so popular it's because I'm, it's what I said about connection before. It's you can't connect when you're performing. You can only really connect when you're being truly authentic and being vulnerable. And that's the quest on every conversation is, can I have a raw, authentic conversation full of sincerity? And I've always had this belief, and I know we've spoken about this, um, you know, on nights out in the past or, or you know, in the, in the, in the good old days. Um <laughs> But I, I strongly believe that we can all learn something from every person we meet. You know, I think it's, I think on some level it's arrogance to think anything else. Every single person has got something to teach us, even if it teaches us how we don't want to behave mm. or what we don't want to do. Mm. Um, and, you know, this last season of the podcast it started off being, you know, health experts each week. And I still absolutely love chatting to, you know, in inverse commas, health experts. But also, you know, yesterday, the conversation with Gareth Southgate uh, went out. You know, the England football manager. Why would I be talking to the England football manager? Well, I believe that we can learn a lot of lessons from how footballers or how a manager has to get this team with so many eyes on it to perform at a high level. I feel we can all learn things from that. I feel understanding some of those tools and principles will help me in my own will help me in my own life access better health. Um so I have and again I talk about comfort zones a lot, right? Mm. So I push myself out of my comfort zone a lot on this podcast because I feel very passionately about I want to live the message that I preach that mm. I talk about. So I'm always excited about new guests from different spheres and different um, different areas to see what I can learn from them. And it's also a nice challenge for me. Can I have a conversation with Gareth Southgate and make it relevant for my audience who may not like football? Well, I hope I did that. Mm. Uh, can I have a conversation with Matthew McConaughey and actually find some wisdom in him that people who follow me for health advice will get something in, in it for, for them? And the feedback's been incredible. Um, and I think it's going to continue to evolve. I want variety. If I had the same kind of guests each week, I'd get bored. Mm. You are really good at bringing out the best in them, I have to say, because I, I, you know, I personally know a few of the people that come on and there are some great moments in there. You know, what are your favorite sort of highlights from the year? It's probably difficult questions yeah, to answer, I mean, but there's too that, many, aren't there? It's asking or, or, who's my favorite child, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> Um, or, or just sort of um, moments that have made you think. You I mean, know. look, if I think about this year, moments, yeah. uh, Gabo Mate, when we all started going into lockdown early mm. on, really, you know, trying to unpick those early emotions that I was having, that Gabo was having, that the world was having with someone as esteemed and someone who I respect as much as Gabo was incredible. John McAvoy, 
Um, John was the New Year's Day episode last year, his story from being armed mm -hmm. robber to being free man now, um, which is the longest one I've ever released, but many people still say it's the best one. I think two and a half hours that was, but you couldn't write that story. Yeah. And if Hollywood wrote that story, you'd think you, they were making it up. Um, but when, he, when I invited him back on in lockdown, that was an incredible conversation because, um, again, sort of coming back to what I was saying before about controlling the controllables, John explained how he was in solitary confinement in the highest security prison in the UK for one year. So he's in a little box for an entire year. And he was sharing what he learned from Nelson Mandela. He was sharing what he learned about himself, which is um, he's still in control. In his mind, he's not in prison, right? In his mind, he's not in prison. He brought up his own routine every morning. He'd be in his cell. He'd do his own prison workout. He'd read. He would control the controllables. And that, if you follow me for health advice, that has just as much application to you as anyone else. Um, so I find it, I find it incredible to learn. Uh, we've got a conversation with Edith Eager that's coming out just after this conversation. Edith. I've got to say that that conversation is probably the conversation that has changed me the most. I am not the same person anymore. Why? Pro Let me get, without sort of, you know, giving it all away. But I mean, what was... What I, was I'll tell the... you why. Because this is a lady who, you know, first of all, she's the oldest guest I've had, right? So I think she's either 93 or 94 at the moment. She went to Auschwitz when she was 16. She's getting on with her life. She doesn't even know Auschwitz exists. Her parents, her, get taken to Auschwitz. Her parents get murdered the day she gets there. She then has to dance for the guy who's regarded as the angel of death. And we spoke for 90 minutes on picking her story, what she learned. She is one of the warmest most forgiving, most caring, most um, non-judgmental individuals I've ever spoken to. I think, wow, you have been through the absolute worst mm. of what is out there in humanity. How is it you're so kind and forgiving at 94 with such wisdom to share? It, it was one of those where actually I, rec I recorded it over Skype and I tell you, I finished it and it was it was it was basically I think my wife had stuff to do that evening and I was meant to be doing bedtime <laughs> and I think the conversation ended on Skype at about I don't know quarter to 7 and I think I'd felt teary for most of the conversation and um I think I rushed into the house to do bedtime and I was I just couldn't concentrate I just actually said to my daughter I think I said Darling, look, daddy's going to go downstairs for 20 minutes. I'm just going to say, I'll come back and read a book to you a bit later. I, I just can't do it at the moment. Um, yeah, I mean... You had to decompress. I had to really decompress. Mm. It took me days, frankly. Um, so that, that, I think, was one of the most powerful conversations I've ever had. Uh, and again, I think there are tools. And, you know, without giving the whole game away, uh, she will also say that, she says, I've been in Auschwitz. But I can still tell you, the biggest prison, the most severe prison you ever go into is the prison you create in your mind. And when you hear that from people like Edith Eager or even, you know, John McAvoy or Nelson Mandela, and you see how they, what they yeah. went through. And again, I'm not trying to compare that at all, just to be clear with Auschwitz and what Edith went through, just mm. so there's no doubt there. But these are really moving moments that change mm. me as a person. And I, yeah. my hope is that if I get moved and I'm changed during a conversation, I find it hard to believe that much of my audience won't feel the same way. I know. I, I can't wait to, to watch that one because I remember reading Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, which has a very similar theme. And I was so moved by reading the book. I can't imagine what it's like to actually talk to someone who's got that kind of lived experience. Yeah, that's going to be... It's an honour. Yeah, it's just it's just it was, a, it was one of those where you just pay homage and go, I am just very lucky that I got the opportunity to talk with her and listen to her 
for yeah. 90 minutes. And, you know, that's one of the most powerful things for me about this podcast is that I have conversations with people that I don't think it's possible to have, or it's very hard to have mm. unless you're on a podcast. Like even with you, we'll find out stuff about each other with the mics on that yeah. we just wouldn't. We would banter around, we do other things. You get to a certain deepness mm. and that's what's missing in the world. I think more than anything is depth. You get to a different level of connection in a way and, and meaning, I think. And obviously the bulk of your year most years for the last four you do a lot of writing obviously because every year you've released a book and then you've got a new book coming out soon what tell us the process behind that because you know I'm, I'm looking at it I've got it here I've got a copy of it here I'm very lucky to have flicked through it and, and actually read it it's quite a different topic um what, what was just tell us your thoughts behind how that came about yeah because if I had to predict what you were going to write a book about this year, a year ago, you know, I always ask you, what do you think? It wouldn't have been this. What would it have been? I don't know, but not this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so look, like the first part of that is about my thinking process as an author. Um, and what I really feel strongly about books are that books are a way to really make change. Books are, I think, quite a unique medium in that you really get into people's lives. And what I think is really um, unique around books in this current era in which we live is how permanent they can be. So an Instagram post, for example, is transient. It's short-lived. You know, you might like it. You might engage with it. You might think about it. But a few days later, it's gone. It's gone into the ether. It's vanished, right? How many of us actually properly save things and go back and look at them later? I mean, a lot of us have the intention and the desire to do that. But then, you know, we get swamped with life and then there's new posts to read. So we forget about it. Whereas I've seen, having released, well, this will be the fourth book in four years, I've just seen the constant feedback from all over the world throughout the year on how these books have got a life of their own, that you get into people's lives, some things connect straight away, sometimes they forget about things, they revisit them later in the year when you know, their sleep goes off or, or a new, they have a bereavement or they lose a job and they, you know, or they get a, a new diagnosis of something that they, they weren't wanting. And I also get a lot of enjoyment out of writing the books because... I find it a very creative process, a very cathartic process for me. And what it, you know, I, I'm very creative. I have a lot of ideas all the time. But what a book forces you to do is to order your ideas. I it's, think it's really hard, isn't it? I mean, it's, um, people who don't see that side of it, I mean, I think I do, don't realize just how involved it is. It's it, brutal, isn't it? It's yeah, I mean, really it's, hard work. It's, it's certainly the most time consuming and challenging thing that I do, I think, um, mm. because of its permanence. Because once it's there and once it goes to print, you're sort of done. And mm. you know that the science may move on. Can't, you, know, you can't click delete like on a post. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you're like, oh, man, I wish I'd rephrase, I wish I'd phrase that a little bit differently because um, so so in terms of books, I love doing it. I've seen the impact it's having. Um, I enjoy it. It upskills me. I feel I'm a better communicator after each book I write because I've had to order new thoughts. And sometimes when you're writing things, you, you think you know something and then you be like, oh, man, that doesn't really flow. Or you need to get clearer in your own brain before you can write that and expect someone to understand that. So I see it as a challenge to myself. Um, but in terms of why this book, there's... I could see why you think it wasn't the natural next book for me. Hmm. But let's go back to the mission. The mission is over the course of my career to try and reach 100 million people if possible, okay? Uh, and it help improve their lives, restore them to optimal health. Now, I think this new book is absolutely consistent with the message in the first three books 
even though that may not be obvious from just reading the title, right? So going back to the mission, how do you reach 100 million people? Well, you have to be able to reach people who are not currently accessing your information, right? So weight loss is a controversial area, and I didn't go into it lightly uh, because it is controversial. I didn't need to go into that area. I could have stayed well away from it, right? But that, for me, would have been the easy thing to do. The harder thing, and I think the right thing to do, was as a medical doctor, was to tackle this head on. You know how many patients come in to see you as a doctor, as I do, who want help with sustainable weight loss, right? Just because the societal narrative has moved on, where we don't like talking about it anymore, I don't feel I can hide from it as a medical doctor. I have to tackle it head on. And the reason I wrote this book, one of the reasons I wrote it, is because there is a section of the population who have been conditioned by society to only pick up a book that says weight loss on the cover. I can write every book I want about promoting health first, physical health, mental health, emotional health, and the weight loss will come as a side effect if you want it to. But there's a section of the population who are not picking up those books because they don't feel it's relevant to them because they want the new celebrity diet plan every January, which hopefully is going to work one year in a way that it didn't work in the previous years. And I'll tell you why, why that bothers me as a doctor is, and I, and I wonder if you share the same experience or not, but I know what it's like, new year, new year. Everyone's feeling motivated. Everyone's like, okay, you know, this year it's going to be different. This year, that is it. I've had enough now. I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting in, right? But what would happen is that come the end of January or February or March, March is often when I would see this with patients, is that not only they did lose weight in January and felt better, had more energy, right? But in March, not only had they gone back to their existing weight, they're over it. But that isn't the worst thing about it. The worst thing about it is that their self-esteem has gone. They feel as if they have failed, right? It's, it's the only industry where we don't blame the diet or the book, we blame ourselves, right? And I kept seeing patients like this who they have been damaged. It's not neutral. It, that, that's the thing. I, I, it, so the penny dropped for me a few years ago. This is not neutral. Going on the diet, rebounding the weight, and then damaging your mental health and your self esteem is toxic. And I thought, well, Rongan, how are you going to reach those people? Because the truth is the four pillar plan will help those people. Yeah, right? no, I was going to say. The stress solution will feel better in five will. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Many people have lost excess weight. Mm. You get lots of messages about loads that. Loads mm. on the first three books, mm. right? I didn't mention weight loss. Mm. But by not mentioning it, I can't reach a lot of people who I think would benefit from this message the most. And so, you know, for people who publish books, there's always um, battles with the publishers on titles. That's the truth. You know, the title has to do a certain job. Actually, on the title, serious question. I would have, I'm no publisher, but I would have thought it would be lose weight, feel great. So you've got feel great, lose weight. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, I mean, that's intentional because I'm trying to get across that this book is going to help you feel great now. Right? I'm going to help you feel good about yourself. I'm going to improve your self-esteem. I'm going to help you with your confidence, with your self-worth. I'm going to give you more energy, more calm now, within days of starting and doing some of the, the tips and, and uh, tools that I share in the book. And any excess weight loss is going to come along as a side effect. It's weight loss as a side effect of physical and mental well-being, right? That is the message in the book. And the reality is, the book is not just for people who want to lose excess weight, but it's impossible to title a book in a short way that actually, um, it, it's so hard giving titles that actually are going to appeal to everyone who you want the, the book to appeal to. So I had to make a decision. I just got to go, I want to reach this audience. I think they're being misserved. I think th there's an audience out there who think that health and actually weight loss is about deprivation punishment, restriction. And I want to share with them, number one, it's not their fault. They're not broken. They don't lack willpower. 
I want to share with them that actually regaining your health, losing excess weight, if you want to do it, is about compassion. It's about fun. It's about enjoyment. It's about self-esteem. Mm. And I mean, you've read it. I don't know what you think. I mean, I, I genuinely believe it's the best book I've written so far. And I believe that people who've read the first three will love it, even if they don't want to lose weight. But does that make sense? Yeah. My, my rationale for writing it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is actually the best written book that you've written, definitely. And I can see it flows beautifully. And there are some really lovely tools, which I want to touch on, actually. And just, uh, you know, things like emotional eating, for example, doesn't often get covered in conventional diet books. And there's a whole area there about, you know, short termism and, and goes back to that thing about checking yourself. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of kind of mental tricks in there, aren't they? Yeah. I say tricks, but you know what I mean? Um, and a lot of them are new. Yeah. A lot of them are brand new things that I've evolved my thinking on mm. um, over the last few years. I was reading the book and I, I basically came across, there were two things that I have immediately sort of implemented myself, which I kind of thought I knew, but I'd sort of didn't. The first is about salads and eating them first. I love that one. Just talk us through that. Yeah, I mean, I think I called it Greens Go First in the yeah, book. Yeah. Um, there, there's there's good scientific research on this now that if you eat a salad uh, at the start of your meal, hmm. you eat less overall. Um, so, so it's just a little trick that people can use if they struggle with overeating or eating too much. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why that is. I mean, eating a salad will typically slow you down. So there's a mindful element to that. Because they're, they're crunchy. You can't really just hoof them down. That's yeah. the point, isn't it? Like, it's, you it, well, you to eat slower as well. Yeah, it forces yeah. you to eat slower. Mm. So you have a bit more time to register the kind of hunger signals, the satiety signals, which they're always there, those signals. But sometimes we're too busy that we're not actually hearing the noise that our bodies are creating for us. Do you know what I mean? We yeah. eat through it. Uh, I, I think <laughs> I, I, sh I share that that thing in the book when I was in first year at university in Edinburgh and one of the local pizza uh, places had eat as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, we used to go to one as well. Yeah, and I shared my tricks and I, I used to say to my buddies, uh, guys, you, you're doing this wrong. You're eating too slowly. You've got to eat so quick that your stomach doesn't register you're full. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think about that now and I think, Wow. You're pretty juvenile, weren't you, Ronga, when you were 18? Like I was, <laughs> but but I, I I think like what we were saying before in the conversation, I think sharing these things is important so people understand that we've all got um certain issues around food. For some of us, it doesn't show up with excess weight, like in me. I could probably overeat quite a bit, and I'm just just genetically not a person who's gonna put on loads and loads of weight but I will feel it in other ways. Yeah. Um, so, so the salad thing is, you know, there's so many practical tips for people in the book that are going to help people. But greens go first is this idea of simply where it's a salad or it could be some vegetables, whatever it is. You eat that first, it slows you down. So it's a bit of mindful eating, but also these things tend to be fiber rich. So they're actually start to fill you up, even physically with a distension in the stomach, you start to fill up before you eat something else. And I and I, I think I may have shared this on the on the podcast before, but like my daughter, for example, if we make something like, I don't know, salmon, sweet potatoes, and broccoli, and I give it her all together, or kale actually is the one with my daughter, she will eat the salmon and the sweet potato wedges no problem. And then often she doesn't have room for the kale. So I have a strategy where I give it a plate of kale first. And you know, when she's eating the kale, she can eat, she can get her salmon and wedges. Now, I'm not saying anyone else should parent like this. This is what I do mm. in a very kind and compassionate way. And you know what? She eats all the kale, right? And then she actually eats less of the wedges in the end because she's full. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I think we can all trick ourselves. Look, if anyone's listening to this and they they think, oh, I'll never fancy the veg. Well, why not have some kale or broccoli at the start with some olive oil, a bit of sea salt if you want on the top? You know, it's I think it's gorgeous. Yeah. How about the start? <laughs> You're just going to allow time for these hunger signals to kick in. Yeah, the, the other, my, I, I love that one. And the other one is more of a concept, actually, the, the buffet effect. I, I love buffets. I've always loved them. And actually, I remember about, it must have been about 10 years ago, uh, we went on a family holiday to Croatia and we booked into one of those hotels, which is buffet, all you can eat. And I put on 
four and a half kilos just in a week, literally. <laughs> it took me about a year to go back to my, norm, my normal weight. But actually, you explain that very well as well about, and I think you, you tell this story about how during lockdown, you were eating very similar food most days. And so you sort of got bored of it. And this concept of, you know how you have an extra tummy for dessert? Yeah. You were covering, you were talking about yeah, that. I mean, and, I, and, you know, it's a joke in my house. The, the kids, they're always full, but they can always manage dessert. Well, I think everyone knows that feeling that you've always mm. got room for ice cream. Or you've always got room for something else, even though you're stuffed. And, you know, I do, I do sort of, I think it's a really fun bit in the book for people, but I talk about the buffet effect, the concept and the scientific term is sensory specific satiety. So we get full for certain flavors. So, you know, if you've had a savory meal, you may be absolutely jam-packed full for those savory flavors that you've had. Doesn't mean you're full for sweetness. Mm. Um, Go back to the chocolate fountain at the buffet. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, the, the few people who've read the early copies or even um, people at my publishers who read it when I was submitting the manuscripts, the amount of emails I got saying, yeah, hotel buffets are my downfall. <laughs> Um, but it's guilty. It, yeah, but w w <laughs> but lockdown has been a tale of two two stories for me. Really, the start of lockdown, when we were eating home cooked meals every day, um, very simple whole food ingredients, quite repetitive after a bit of time, you know, mm. because there wasn't the opportunity to kind of spice it up with a takeaway or, you know, it was. Do you know what I mean? It was very different, and I found wow, I'm starting to get a bit bored sometimes in the meal, and actually. I'm eating less because I haven't got the option of spicing it up with something else. And it really got me thinking about this whole concept of how we've started to look at foods. Like food shouldn't be boring. It should be enjoyable. Hmm. Absolutely. But how enjoyable? Right? Does every single meal we eat need to be Insta-ready and mind-blowingly tasty? Because I think many of us have been conditioned to think it does need to be. Like I've got no problem making you know, double the amount of, let's say, a butternut squash soup at lunch and eating that for dinner as well. But even within my own family, that's like, you know, it's like, well, can we not have something different? We've already had that for lunch. And I, I kind of think on an evolutionary level, have we ever been that picky about food where... You just uh, eat when you can and what you, you can. You eat what yeah. you can when you can, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and I think if you look at the blue zones, these areas around the world where... Uh, people live to high rates, you know, they've got really good rates of longevity, but in really good health, they've got this core group of whole food ingredients and they just recirculate them over and over mm. again, but they enjoy their food. So I say in the book, I have this message that not every single meal needs to be a gourmet Instagram ready meal. And I think, again, I've spoken about social media on this culture, but I think it really drives this idea that, I don't know, just some potatoes and veg and a bit of a protein sauce, mm. you know, whether you eat, you know, meat or, or, mm. you, or you're vegan, it just doesn't feel enough. We feel like we've somehow mm. failed because oh, when I want on Instagram, everyone's, everyone's breakfast and lunch looks just amazing. And they present yeah. it beautifully. Like it, it goes back to what I was saying before, Ian, which is we're constantly made to feel like failures, like that what we do is not enough. The food we make, it's mm. not enough because it doesn't look like I think everyone else is having their meals now. We don't think that actually sometimes to get a shot for Instagram, or, and I know from cookery books and from, from chatting to, to teams at publishers, it can take four or five hours to get one shot. It's nuts, isn't it? Lighting, everything is all done to make it absolutely pop. It's like, well, you cannot compare your breakfast, lunch, and dinner each day to that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's not four or five hours to prepare it. That's four to five hours just to take the right shot. Mm. And so there's all kinds of things in the book like this in terms of the hormones that get released mm. when we're eating, why many of us can't resist certain foods. Mm. Um, but I said there's two, two tales to lock down. The start of it, yeah, I was eating really well, really well. But I had this moment in the summer and I, and I know I mentioned that the 2020 for me has been personal growth on steroids. I've been doing a lot of inner work. And there was about a four week period, maybe six weeks where I had a real problem with sugar. I couldn't stop eating sugar. And That's really unlike you. Mm. Yeah, it's really unlike me. I just couldn't stop. It's not that I don't know of the harmful effects of too much sugar. You know, I probably covered it in my last three books, right? It's not that I don't know that with my rational brain, yeah. 
But that's the key about foods. Many of our food choices don't come from the rational brain, they come from the emotional brain. I was doing a lot of stuff about my childhood and my relationship with my parents and how mm. I saw my self-worth. And I, I, I remember that, I, I still remember like with my brother sneaking down to the kitchen and then and then the, I mean, you've, you've, you've obviously been to my, my parents' house mm. many times. Uh, and in the kitchen, just past the counter, there's this, there's this cupboard and there was this old, um, I guess it's like a cookie jar, but it didn't have cookies and you'd open it. And it had all those kind of fun sized chocolates. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's crunchies or Mars bars or whatever it was, it was all the there. The miniatures, yeah. The miniatures. Mm. And I, I can still remember like on a Saturday afternoon, I don't know where my parents were, I still remember going there and just eating quite a few of them. Back in, in the day when Snickers was marathon. Back in, exactly. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, I, and I feel that I've tapped into something there where I used to get a lot of comfort from sweet things. And I think that mirrored what I was going through at a certain time. The reason I'm, I'm saying it is because A, it's the truth, and B, that's, that actually relates to my favorite section in the new book, which is why we eat. Hmm. And frankly, that's relevant to all of us, right? I wasn't eating because I, I didn't need a lecture on what sugar was doing to me. I know it. I've written books on that, right? I, I, it, I needed help. I needed to learn to help myself really understand what was driving the sugar intake, right? It was emotional. And the way I describe it in the book, and I, I think this really sums it up for people, is that we used to use food to fill a hole in our stomachs. Now we use food to fill a hole in our hearts. And it, I, I just want to let that sit with people for a minute because for everyone listening to this now or watching this, when was the last time you used food to fill a hole in your heart and not your stomach? Because by understanding that, that's the key to change. Right, that's the key. When we're bored, we eat. When we're lonely, we eat. When we're stressed out, we eat. When we've had a row with our partner, we eat. When, we, when the kid's bedtime has gone on too long, we eat, right? You don't need a new diet book saying, you don't need a new book on sugar necessarily. You need to understand what's driving that. The freedom exercise in the book. Yeah, that's great. That is, is yeah. um, I, I, The three Fs. The three Fs, yeah. And, and the reason I know it's on page 93, right, is because when I was doing the final edits, I refer to that exercise maybe 10 times in the book because I think it's so important and it goes beyond food. Well, it's the freedom exercise, the three Fs, it's really simple. The three Fs are feel, feed, find. Okay, so if you want to relate this to food, I'd ask someone who, you know, whether it's a patient or someone listening to this, to say, look, Next time you get a craving for something, let's say you're watching telly and you've got a craving to have some ice cream at night. Okay, ask yourself, just take a pause. What are you really feeling? Is it hunger? Is it physical hunger or is it emotional hunger? Right? Are you really hungry or have you just had a row with someone? Have you had a, a crap day where you've been on Zooms indoors all day and you've not been outside yet? Is that your little reward for yourself? Um, you know, have you had a, you know, a row with someone? Have you, you, you really, really stressed? You know, have you fallen out with your kids? You know, what is going on really? I and mean, then you can still eat it. I'm just saying, take a quick pause, right? And it's about, in a very gentle way, starting to help people gain awareness. So it's like, okay, cool. All right, I get it. I'm, I want the ice cream because I'm not done much today. I fell out with my wife before and this is going to make me feel a bit better. Okay, cool. Now have the ice cream. The second F, when you're ready for it, is, okay, now that you know what the feeling is, now can you identify how that sugar or that food feeds that feeling? Ah, oh, okay, when I feel down and stressed, I have ice cream, I feel better. Okay, cool. Now you're just starting to reprogram, you're starting to gain an awareness. Then the third F is find. Now that you know what the feeling is, now that you know how your snack feeds that feeling, the third F is fine. Can you find an alternative behavior that's going to help you feed that same feeling? That could be, mm. 
could be running a bath. It could be doing a 10 minute yoga flow on YouTube. It could be doing some star jumps. It could be giving your partner or your mm. pet a hug. Yeah, in the book, you call it stealing a cuddle from a family member, which, yeah. I, lo- which I loved. I thought that yeah. was really good. Or it could be changing mm. the environment. It could be, oh, in that room, because the brain is a very associative organ. Or maybe I won't go to that room. If you mm. have the luxury of going to a different room where you don't tend to snack. So, and, and can I just say that exercise because I, I do believe that most authors write the books that they need for themselves. And I think that's absolutely the case with this book, even though most people say, I don't need to lose excess weight. But I think the tools have really helped me. That works. If you find yourself scrolling Instagram for too long each evening, and you're trying to reduce it and you can't, do the three Fs on your Instagram usage. Mm. If you're trying to cut down on booze, right, which many people are trying to do at this time of year, you're pointing your finger at me. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I didn't mean, I, I mean to. Uh, I, I didn't mean to. But <laughs> if you are, yeah. use the three Fs on your alcohol intake. And this goes back to what we were saying, that this is just so much mm. more than weight loss. I, th- I think that's the thing. You, you've there's so, there's so many elements. And actually, for some, anyone who reads the book, they'll realize, you know, there's a section, for example, on mindful eating and 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 for me that comes down to savoring you know that's what i would how i would sort of describe it to my kids for example because you know but um and it's interesting you mention alcohol because a few years ago when i was drinking a bit more regularly i suddenly thought you know what i'm going to actually sort of drink less alcohol but savor it more you know literally sort of think about every sip and 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 you mentioned that in the book which i think again you know and actually once you put it all together you know you explain the sort of science behind cravings and then you 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 give us these tools to try it all just i can see how it would just click together it's just it's it isn't a weight loss book it, it, it but actually as you say as a byproduct you will lose weight um it's, if you it's, want to yeah. if you, yeah, if you if, want to yeah. if you mm. if that's your goal and you're trying yeah. to lose excess weight Great. If it isn't, if you just want to improve your health, your happiness, mm. your longevity, I think the tools are going to help you. Mm. Um, you know, it's interesting that it is, you know, the whole idea of weight loss is, is controversial. Um, and there's this... Yeah, do, have you had any f- flack about writing it or...? Yeah, you know, when I, when I, not much, if I'm honest, but I think like you, some of my audience may be surprised... Hmm. Uh, when I first announced the cover, uh, I think just before the summer, I first hmm. announced for the first time that I was writing a book that was coming out. Um, it's pretty bright, isn't it? It, it is pretty bright. <laughs> it is pretty bright. Um, yeah. It was interesting. There were a few comments, uh, not many, I will say, but I had a few private messages sent to me, a few people commenting on social media saying, Dr. Shashi, I love everything you've done so far. Love your TV shows, love your podcasts, love your first three books. Really, really disappointed in you for jumping on the weight loss bandwagon, for getting involved with diet books. Um, And it's really interesting because in every Mm. post I've done about it, I've been very, very clear that this is not a diet book. Mm. There is no diet in the book to follow. Um, I've really explained what it's about but I do feel that I've been, uh, you know, the phrase don't judge a book by its cover, I think has very much uh, been at play with some people. And, you know, I welcome those because mm. they're an opportunity for me to learn. You know, initially I was a bit frustrated because I thought I've really tried to make that clear. And you're judging me and criticizing me based on something that's not in the book. But then I use it as a mirror. You know, what can I learn about that? Oh, it meant I need to get clearer in my vision. I needed to get really clear in why I wrote that book, really understand it myself, because they're entitled. Everyone is entitled to have their view. And I respect people's views. Now, I tried to engage with a couple of them really respectfully. Hmm. Um, unfortunately, I don't, feel, I don't feel that uh, a, a few of them did respectfully engage back. A few of them were quite derogatory hmm. back. And certainly that was my perception of it. So I think, is it worth my time really trying here? Because some people will judge it, sure. But I'm committed to that 100 million figure. I'm committed to those people who feel worthless each year, who are failed by these two-week diet plans each year, the people who who wreck their self-esteem, who can't stand to look at themselves in the mirror because of how they perceive their identity is wrapped up 
in the amount of fat they have. And in the book, I start right at the start of the book. You, I'm hoping the cover gets people who might usually pick up a celebrity diet plan, pick it up. And from paragraph one, I'm hoping to reshape their view about weight loss, about health, but also reshape their view about themselves. You know, there's this, there's this part in the book, which um, in the Why We Eat section, which I've called obesity as a symptom. And I don't know if you're familiar with the ACEs studies uh, that Dr. Vincent Folletti mm. did. Uh, ACEs stands for ACE, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Um, and he showed a very strong correlation between people who've experienced uh, trauma, could be physical abuse, could be emotional abuse, and obesity. And I share some stories, but one of them is about this um, patient who was never overweight before. And in her late teens, she started to put on weight and she was really, really struggling. And I spent time with her, really trying to understand what was happening. I really got this inkling that there was a huge emotional component here. I started to unpack a bit of it with her while I was gaining her trust. Then we did get uh, a therapist to help as well. And what transpired was, I think it was when she was about 16, that she'd been in an abusive relationship. And um, basically, she wasn't aware of this, but her subconscious, in essence, was trying to protect her. And her way of never being in an abusive relationship again was to put on extra weight. Because in her mind, of course, incorrectly, but in her mind, she felt that if I carry lots of extra fat and extra weight on me, no man is going to find me attractive ergo, I'm not going to be in an abusive relationship again. And for her, she doesn't need the government telling her to take more personal responsibility, right? She had tried loads. She didn't need people making her feel bad, right? What she needed was compassion, was help, was understanding, was empathy. And she lost her weight. But it was an it was it was all emotional. We had to tackle that. It wasn't easy to, but it was possible. Um, and there's you know, so so I really feel that I've really tried to take us rounded a view. I think I don't know what you think about this, but I think as 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 people who have um, gone into general practice, I feel we're in a really, in some ways, a luxurious position, and not luxurious in terms of uh, I don't mean. <laughs> in terms of workload, I mean luxurious in terms of we get to see everything. I feel that these 20 years of experience as a doctor has given me a very rounded approach to go, there is no one size fits all, right? You can absolutely pretty much help every single person lose a lot of their excess weight once you find the right approach for them, right? That's the key. Just because your body lost uh, weight on a low carb diet, doesn't mean you're going to, right? Just because your friend dropped a dress size in two weeks on the latest celebrity diet plan, maybe that's not the right approach for you. And and my one of my favorite bits actually is, is the bit that, that the book was due to go to print. And I remember having this idea and I, and I, and I emailed Penguin or did I phone them? I think I emailed them saying, I'm really sorry, it can't go. But what do you mean? It's all right. I said, no, 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 I've got a new line. I've got to add it in. <laughs> I'm like, wrong. Come on, we've got it. No, 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 this is going in the book. Um, and it's just before the conclusion. And it's something like this. And when your friends ask you what plan you're doing, you can tell them you no longer follow anyone else's plans because you've been empowered to create your own. It's like your life, your plan, I think it is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. What, mm. This is not the Dr. Chatterjee plan. Mm. I walk people through all the various factors that may be contributing to their health, may be contributing to their excess weight, right? If that's what they're after. And then I help the reader create their own plan and design their own plan. Because you need that ownership. Long-term following my plan I think that's going to help anyone. They need to be in charge. They need to understand their own behaviors, their body, why they make certain choices, their emotions. And there are so many practical tools to help people do that. Um, You know, 
if you bring it back to 2020 a second, you know, we've we've had these phrases, haven't we, about, you know, what is it? Uh Corona Stone, the Corona Stone, I think the media call it, or the mm. the the, the, the um, what is it, the quarantine 15. Mm. Mm. Right, basically, it's kind of common parlance now, isn't it? That many people have or feel that they put on excess weight during 2020. Mm. Yeah, guilty there as well. <laughs> what you... See, even the language I'm using, guilty. I just said, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That says it all. And there's there's a, there's a whole section on language and how we how we go about changing that. So, a lot of studies have been done on this. The best research that I can find suggests that. 80% of us change our eating behavior in response to stress. Okay, 45% of us eat more, 35% of us eat less. So let's think about 2020. It's probably been one of the most stressful and anxiety inducing years in living memory for many people. If 45% of us, that's nearly half of us, eat more in response to stress, of course, lots of people have put on weight, right? But it doesn't mean they need a new diet. It doesn't mean they need the latest January diet book because the diet may not be the problem. It's the stress that's causing the eating behavior. So maybe for an individual, oh, you need better tools to help you manage that stress. You need to find other ways, you know, and that's why there's a whole section on this in the mm. book is to help people go, if stress is the problem, you don't need a new diet. You need, to, you need to find another way to manage that stress. Mm. Maybe that freedom exercise I mentioned might be one of those mm. ways. Well, that's, that's the other thing I love about, <clears throat> about the book is that like your other books, you don't have to do everything in it for, it, for to, to notice the benefit. And one of the things that I, I thought about for myself, so I've, I, I'll be honest, I put on eight kilos since the first lockdown, which is a, a lot bearing in mind. I, I think I'm normally 74 and I'm 82 at the moment. And the last time I lost a load of weight was when I changed practice, which was in 2011. So in my in my old practice, my, one of my favourite podcast episodes of yours this year is the one with Daniel Lieberman, which is which I'll come to because this story is relevant to my weight loss. So I lost 10 kilos in weight within a year of changing practice. My diet didn't change, and the only thing that changed was in my old practice, I used to have a button to summon the patient in through these locked doors and in my new practice I'd get up every 10 minutes to bring them in from the waiting room and you mentioned this in your book you know it's called NEAT you know this non-exercise kind of thermogenic kind of activity which is basically not actually exercise like going to a gym but just movement you know yeah. and and it's and I'm not doing that at the moment because of course I'm doing most of my work on the phone so I'm not getting up as much um but, you know, and it only just hit me recently thinking, hang on, that's why I'm putting the weight back on. And for, for me, that's obviously very important. But I think if you look at all the facets that you've mentioned, there's something in there for everyone. They'll relate to some part of it or all of it. You know, that's the, that's the, the genius of this, I think. I think it's great. I mean, what's interesting for me as I hear that um, is movement is one component, right? So, I mean... To me, as one of your close friends, I think there's been a lot of stress on you this year. Mm. And so it could also be, or could could it be that the stress in your life this year has contributed maybe to other behaviors to deal with that stress that may have potentially also contributed to the weight gain as opposed to the movement? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's definitely more than one thing. It's never one thing. There's some really good work from Herman Ponce in the last few years. Um, and it's this idea that moving more always leads to burning off more. It's what we were taught. It's what we've always thought yeah. conventionally. But it's not true, right? It doesn't always. You know, your body is a complex system. So he has studied the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, right? We talk about the Hadza mm. and we talk about it in our course where we teach doctors. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're this kind of hunter-gatherer tribe. Their lives are still relatively untouched by modernity. And they're pretty, they move a lot. They run down antelopes, don't they? They do, but yeah. they, they move a lot in the <laughs> day, much more than the average sedentary Westerner. True, yeah. But what do they burn off each day? 2,000, 2,100 calories. What does the average sedentary Westerner burn off each day? 2,000, 2,100 calories, roughly. Mm. So they're moving more than us, 
but they're not burning off more calories. And I think there's a lot to unpick there for people because I feel we're punishing ourselves, we're pushing ourselves on treadmills. I'm not saying more movement do- won't lead to more calories being burned, but we think if we've done something that gives another, um, that the calorie counter says 300 calories, we think that's added on to the amount of energy we expended that day, but it's not true in all cases. Sometimes your body will burn less from other areas to compensate. Yeah. And that's why um, improving health, but also trying to lose excess weight requires, in my view, a holistic approach, a rounded approach. And, and that's why in the movement section, I say, don't move to burn off more calories, right? Move to make yourself feel good to show your body that you're an active, thriving human who's engaging with life. That's what movement does. Because the truth is you can lose weight without doing any movement. That is that is absolutely true. Would I recommend it? Absolutely not. Because movement is one of the fastest ways to improve your self-esteem, which is why some of the daily habits in the book, there's, there's, there's one, of the, one of them is there's the three daily habits are lift, connect, reflect. And lift mm. is about, you know, keep a dumbbell or a kettlebell in your kitchen. And even if all you do each day when you make a cup of tea is three, five bicep curls in each arm with it, that's fine with yeah, me. It's better than nothing, isn't it? No, is As it better it? than nothing? You just, no one, no one feels worse after that. No. Everyone feels better about themselves. It's a mm. self-esteem issue. Mm. And I kind of feel that the narrative around weight loss in society, I think it's incredibly problematic, which, which, which is one of the reasons, again, one of the many reasons why I wrote this book is because I want to challenge that. Um, there are so many factors at play that we don't think about. For many people, weight loss is actually a self-esteem issue. Mm. It's not a physical issue. It's not a diet issue. It's not a movement issue. It's a how do you feel about yourself issue right? It's about self-respect. And I don't say that looking down at people. I say that with as much compassion as I can possibly muster, right? It's, it's about trying to help us value ourselves and look in that mirror and like the person looking back at you. Because once you can love the person who looks back at you, I tell you, losing excess weight ain't as hard as it's been made out. So I think that's one thing. Other narratives out there that really frustrate me, and I and I need to talk about this, are um, just looking at food and movement in terms of calories only, right? Calories is the most divisive thing to talk about. I will say I do understand that for some people, calorie counting does work for them. Okay, fine. I'm not trying to take away from anyone's experience on that. But for the vast majority of people who I've seen in 20 years, it doesn't tend to work well particularly in the long term. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I know someone who, you know, when they were 11, 11 years old on holiday with the dads, they go on the treadmill, right? With the dad on holiday on the treadmill after half an hour, I think the calorie counts is something like 300 calories. And his dad says to him, what well, on Sunday, you've ate yourself a Mars bar. <laughs> Boom. That starts off at the age of 11, years of a problematic relationship with foods. And I think yeah. we're at risk of doing that in society. We're reducing food and movement down to a, to a number of calories. Food is more than that. Food is information for your body. It's, it changes your hormones, your genetic expression, your moods can mm. all be changed by food. So much more than energy, movement, what it does for your mental health, for your self-esteem, it's incredible. But we've made it about calories. And I actually think the government, um, you know, I never get too political on purpose, but I, I think... I think they're missing a big part of the picture. Mm. Um, I feel a lot of the messaging is around shaming people, making them feel bad. I tell you what, if you work with real life people, shame never helps anyone in the long term. It might it might work for four to six weeks. Yeah, it doesn't work beyond that. What's the solution then? Because I mean, obviously, you have to kind of intervene at a grassroots level. You know, so children are your target, really, aren't they? In terms of this this sort of idea of compassion and you know all, all the things that you talk about in the book in terms of our relationship with food and sitting around a table eating with others you know there's, there's so much stuff in there what what's the what's the root cause of this you know because we live in an obesogenic environment don't we it's the environment number one for mm-hmm. sure mm. um you know if you took your great-grandparents 
or our hunter-gatherer ancestors and put them in a time machine and put them into the 21st century, I think within months, you would also see the same levels of overweightness and obesity that you see in the population today. I don't think we've suddenly become the most lazy and gluttonous group of humans ever to walk the planet in the last 20, 30 years. No, the environment has changed. Mm. Um, and I actually think, you know, I've been thinking about this recently. I think, I think it's primarily an environmental issue. I think if we could, and this is why I kind of feel government does have a role, if we can help change various environments, uh, hospital environments, school environments, which you mm. know I make a big thing of in the books. I'm very passionate about what should and should not be served in schools. In my view, work environments, um, I feel you really make impacts without actually relying on the individual. Massive impact. Uh, I think some of the things like banning junk food advertising after so I think that's that's a step in the right direction for sure. These things are going to help. Mm. We know that the research is there's so much on this. You know, if you live somewhere where there's only three fast food restaurants in a one mile radius from your house compared to six, I think there's forty percent less chance of you being overweight or obese. Schools, you know, if schools ban snacking and eating in corridors and in classrooms. I think obesity rates go down by about 10, 11%, just without actually changing an individual's behavior. But I also think that, you know, that there's a bit of Frankel quotes that when a man doesn't have a sense of meaning, they distract themselves with pleasure, mm. right? And I, I really think about this and how that relates. Why, why are we, why are 65%-ish of the UK population overweight or obese by the kind of standardized metrics, which I know a lot of people question, and that's a separate conversation. But by those measurements, it's about 65%, I think, at the moment. What is it? It's an obesogenic environment. But I think what it is, is that we've always sought to numb our discomfort with things, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's gambling, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, mm. right? We've always done that, humans. I just don't think it's ever been easier to numb that discomfort with food. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. Even people who know it's not a good idea. You know, I, I shared before what I've been doing in lockdown or what I did for a few weeks, right? It's not coming from the rational brain. These are emotional decisions for so many of us. And that's where I think the environment, you know, uh, one of the things that is consistent in all my work is please try your best to control the environments you can control. I don't bring that stuff that I'm trying to avoid eating into my house. Because if I do, I'm going to eat it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say, oh, you need to improve your relationship. You need to teach yourself better self-control. You know what? I disagree. I disagree. The minute you walk out your front door these days, you have to use willpower, discipline, restraint everywhere you go. You got the train here today, right? I do mention you sensation in the book where I sort of divulge a few other things, but um, you know, that is just a haven of temptation. Mm. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you on the mics uh, whether, whether you succumbed or not, but 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 the point is is that you no, have not, to use willpower today. up there. Let's not use it in the house as well. Asleep. Yeah. What about sleep? Mm. Some of my patients, I've got them to improve their health, lose excess weight just by tackling their sleep. Mm. If you sleep five hours a night compared to eight hours, right? On average, you will eat 22% more calories the following day. Over five days of not sleeping well, that's a whole extra day's worth of calories. Mm. Yet the narrative is around food and punishing exercise. I'm getting quite fired up now because... This is why I wrote that book. It was really to go, look, I'm sick of hearing this narrative year in, year out. I'm sick of how the government try and play this and put blame on people. I'm not against personal responsibility, right? But it's not that at the expense of environmental responsibility. Um, it's not about, you can, you can talk about personal responsibility without blaming people. And I think it's both. I think we need to find better environments. Um, I'm, Let's see how this goes. There is a slight campaigning element to this book in the final section about letters that people can use to write to their head teachers or their employers to change the environments in their school and in their workplace to make it easier to make the healthy choices. 
Um, I hope people get on board with that. I really do. I, f- I feel that all teachers and head teachers are trying to do their best. I just don't feel that they really understand that a lot of these foods are designed to be addictive, right? It's, you can't use willpower. There's this is great um, article in the New England Journal of Medicine and this editorial in 2015, I think it was Deborah Cohen, talking about how most of our food choices are automatic. They are so influenced by the environment. I just don't see a case anymore in a world and where in the UK where one in three kids start secondary school, so at the age of 11, one in three kids are overweight or obese, right? I just don't see a case anymore for schools serving anything other than healthy food. I really don't. I don't think that's a nanny state. I think parents and families have got every right to feed their kids whatever they want. But what I don't want as a parent is school taking that away from me and putting this stuff in front of my children. And even worse still, and I get lots of parents writing to me about this, it is, it is toxic. It's not neutral, right? Because what it does is the, the families who are really trying hard, not only do you undermine their messaging, but then you risk those kids becoming social outcasts. If you're not the one having the lollipops and the chocolates, you know, my, this week at my, my children's school, on two consecutive days, first day, Diet Coke was being given out, right? Next day was, I think, fizzy Ribena or, I mean, and I get it, right? It's the trying to celebrate Christmas. But there's other ways. Hmm. There's completely other ways. Uh, it's not, it's not, I'm not saying, mm. I'm not telling parents what to do with their children. I'm mm. saying that the schools, workplaces, hospitals, let's get these environments mm. working for us. If we can't do that for our kids, what are we going to do? Yeah, there's, it's, it's interesting. There are, there are two things that spring to mind. So one is that um, in France, they have this thing called Le Goute. Do you, have you heard of that? So it's basically where children come back from school and they get a sweet treat. It's normally a cake or something sweet. And as a result, they don't expect anything at any other time of day because they, they know they're going to get it if they want it, which I think is really interesting. And, and actually, you talk a bit about the French and their, yeah. their weights in, in, in the book. And the other thing is a memory, actually, of, of y- yourself, me, and Jeremy when we were in... <laughs> San Francisco airport about three years ago and um, the food on the flight was abysmal won't name the airline but so we thought we'd sort of eat something before getting on the plane back and um, so we went round whatever it was I can't remember the name of the store that's sort of in the airport terminal but there was just nothing there and it's a lesson to me and actually talking to you now makes me realize that you know, my eye and actually Jeremy's as well, I think, just d- didn't catch the same things as yours. And and we, we just gave up and went, oh, you know, we'll just have to eat, you know, the, the crap on the plane, which was just inedible. And um, and you sort of suddenly came back with these two massive trees of celery and like a kilo of almond butter. And we just sort of sat there, <laughs> sort of like munching through. It's really tasty. And I was like, well, how, how we... We didn't even see that. You know, we just sort of walked past it. It didn't sort of register with us as something that we could eat. But, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, you know, and I think that changes as well when your palate changes and your your kind of eye catches other things. Do you know what I mean? You, you, know, see, you, go you to, see you see what you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, it's, it's the same with anything. It's like if you, you can train yourself to see the positive in people, mm. right? If you're always looking at the negative in people and wishing things were other... Than they, the, the way they are, that becomes a habit. But mm. you can train yourself to look for those choices that you may want to make um, more of. And again, there's nothing wrong with people not making those choices if they don't want to. Or they go, you know what? I'm in an airport. I'm mm. with my mates. I want to just have a, a burger and fries, right? I am not here to tell anybody else what they should do with mm. their life. I'd like to think that's an approach that's been with me in all my years of seeing patients and in every book. It's, I'm not telling someone what to do. Mm. I'm trying to share information that I hope causes them to reflect and go, oh, I, I could do that. I might want to change things a little bit. Do you know what I mean? Well, you talk about blissy foods as well. We didn't touch on that. Yeah, blissy yeah. foods. I mean, that was my way of trying to, 
you know, I love the creative process of writing. It's like, how can I really get this across to people? But, you know, I, I, there's a whole section on um, how certain foods are made with certain combinations of fat, sugar, and salt mm. that really make it very hard to resist. Can we say they're truly addictive? That is a very controversial area. Mm. Can one truly be addicted to something that we need? You know, we need food to survive. We don't need alcohol or gambling to survive. I like to stay away from the controversy. I let the academics fight about that. We can say that certain foods have addictive-like qualities. And there's certain mm. foods that we find very hard to resist. And it's because of the way they're designed and this has been done intentionally. So certain combinations of foods will spike a lot of the hormone dopamine, um, which is a chemical in your brain. And dopamine gives you a feeling of intense reward but it's also called the learning molecule because what dopamine does is it helps teach you to repeat that same behavior over and over again, such to the point, and you know, and if, you know, smoky bacon, for example, or salted caramel, these things didn't exist 40 years ago. Well, no one would put those two things together, but now they do. And I bet you someone is listening to this or watching this right now and they're stomach has started to water. The mouth has started to water, the salivating and the thought of smoky bacon, salted caramel, right? That's the thing with dopamine, is that once you've conditioned yourself to that dopamine release, then even in anticipation of the food, you release dopamine. Even the mere sight of the food or the smell of the food spikes the dopamine release in your brain. So, Many of us find it very hard to resist. We walk past a, a bakery and there's that smell. And we, we, we're wondering why when we're on the latest diet plan, why five minutes later, we're still in there ordering two pounds of chocolate. It's still so evocative, isn't it? Yeah. The, the, uh, the, but, um, but when you understand that it's your hormones and it's these brain chemicals and it's not because you're a failure or you lack willpower, it's because certain foods have been engineered that way, hmm. Right. At least if you know that, you can stop beating yourself up. There's so much in there. I, I, I absolutely love it. I always ask you this every year, but, you know, you, um, what's in store for next year for you? <laughs> um, look, I think one thing that this year has taught us is, frankly, we don't know what the next 12 months looks like. When <laughs> yeah. we had this conversation last year, I don't think any one of us would have predicted the way life has changed for all of us in 2020. Hmm. So with that caveat in place, um, look what's in store, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm always challenging myself, right? Hmm. I'm always pushing myself hmm. to, so how can you simplify your message? How can you get this message to reach more people? Hmm. S simplifying is, is something I always think about. Um, it's something I've I've always, and I think I've got better at it in the, in, the, in the recent books, is how can you distill down a message down to its absolute essence? Because simplicity means people go and actually make change, right? I want to reach new audiences. I want, I still see a very sick society out there. I see a society, my, I'm an optimist, but the pessimistic part of me thinks that the impact of 2020 is going to bite and it's going to bite in a way that I think we're going to have, or we're potentially at risk of a mental health epidemic. Um, I think what we saw in 2020 was the sort of thing you see with human nature in general, or even in medicine, with a huge focus on acute. We look at the acute problems, the short-term problems. But I don't think there's been enough of a conversation this year about the negative impact of keeping social animals that humans are away from each other, not touching each other, not cuddling each other, not connecting with each other. Teenagers at a very formative part of their life, not seeing their friends, right? And, and it, you know, we don't probably have time today to get into the pros and cons of both sides of that. But I strongly feel that A, we've not spoken about that enough, I've had Professor Francis McLean on this show before talking about, you know, one of the world's leading researchers in touch and how when we when we when we touch another human being and we stroke them, that it does something in our emotional brain. It lowers levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Many people have been starved of touch this year. Starved. 
I think that's going to bite at some point. So for me, the optimist part of me thinks we've also all learned some lessons about ourselves this year and hopefully we'll really value relationships and connections and the thought that, hey, we've not managed to see our friends and our family and our loved ones this year anywhere near to the level as much as we would have liked to. So the optimist part of me feels, you know what? Maybe this will be a turning point for humanity in terms of what we value. Going back to how do we define success? What is success for you? So what are my plans for next year? Personally, I want to get a better definition of what success looks like for me. So at the end of the year, I can actually assess myself and go, have I met my definition of success, not society's? But professionally, it's about reaching more people. How can I reach more people? How can I simplify messaging? But also, for me, and I'd like to think I do this in the podcast, I want to take health outside the health space. Health is not something that is separate from the rest of our lives. Health is an integral part of who we are. You know, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our life. We get more out of our work, out of our relationships, out of our free time. And I I kind of feel that this is what I really try and do on this show, but I'm going to try and think of more ways next year to to really expand that. I want to show people that you you can live the best life that you want to live and health is going to help you do that even better. Do you know what I mean? So that's, I think, what drives me. So I'm going to be thinking, yeah, I mean, that's got me quite fired up. I'm going to be, I'm going to be thinking of how I can do that potentially. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a busy guy, aren't you? I mean, you, have, you always have a lot on. Um, what about downtime? Is that something that you're going to be looking to prioritize as well? Well, I do. Mm. Mm. I, I mean, it may look as though I'm busy mm. and... But yes, when, I, when you're off, you're off sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I feel the way I can get so much done is I can be very regimented about certain things. So a few things for me, like I have a morning routine every morning, uh, which revolves around solitude where I do, you know, a bit of breath work, a bit of meditation, a bit of movement, a bit of positive mindset stuff while I'm drinking a hot drink. Okay. I am so much more efficient as a human being when I've, when I've given myself that time in the morning, I absolutely prioritize my sleep, right? So as you know, yeah. I go to bed very early. I know, I've noticed the, the unread texts that are sent at like uh, 10 p.m. Yeah. It's like, oh, he's, he's gone to bed. <laughs> yeah, but I do. And, and yeah. I, I know that I prioritize and I, it's like a, this kind of non-negotiable, I will be in bed for this amount of hours. Mm. Um, and then I will switch off at various times. Like if I'm having dinner with the mm. kids and the family, there is no technology in sight. Mm. Um, I'm not particularly good at getting back to people on email or text for that matter. Mm. Um, it's something I, I need to really wrestle with because I don't want to let people down. But also that I kind of, I prioritize me and my family first. Mm. If that means I've got 30 unread emails that I don't get back to, I've learned to be okay with that. I do have downtime. I, pri- I I think I prioritize it more and more as each year goes. Um, but I, I would argue that it's the structured downtime that allows me to do so many seemingly different things mm. without it burning me out. Yeah. That's great. We could talk forever, couldn't we? Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, I just... Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see where we are this time next year. Um, but I'm sure there's lots in store. But, I, you know, I, I love this book. I think it's great. And I really hope it does as, as well as your other books. They've all been bestsellers, haven't they? The, pressure, yeah, look, the pressure's on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah, I mean, look, pressure is, an, is a perception. Mm. I'm a human. So, of course... I know how well the first three books have sold. Of course, I would like this one to do as well, if not Mm. better. Of course I would. You know, I am a human being. But if it isn't, it doesn't change who I am. Mm. It doesn't mean that I have failed. It doesn't mean that I am a failure. 
it doesn't mean that it's even a bad book. Do you know what I mean? And that's a big difference. And that actually is, is sort of the message in the book as well. It's kind of like, it's not your worth. It's not who you are. You know, it's, I've tried in life in general to divorce myself from the outcome of what I do, whether it's in health changes. It's like, it's about the process. It's about the journey. It's not about the destination. Easy to say, very hard to do. And really with this book, you know, if we go back to right full circle, control the controllables, what can I control? I can control how deeply I think about these ideas. I can control how many times I try and rewrite and craft paragraphs to really move people. I can control up to the point of publication or till it goes off to be printed. I can control changing it. But once it's done, I can't do anything about it anymore. I am very, very proud of this book. I believe it will change the lives of every single person who reads it. But if people don't pick it up and read it, I still like the person that I see when I look in the mirror each morning. Yeah, that's that's what it's about, isn't it? And, and I hope, honestly, that it gets you much closer to that that magic hundred million number, and I'm sure it will. It is um, a real a real piece of work, honestly. Congratulations on it, and um, all the best for 2021. You too, buddy. Cheers. Really hope you enjoyed that conversation. Please do think about one thing that you can take and apply into your life. Inspiration is not enough. You need to take action. If you did enjoy that, please do press subscribe, hit that notification bell, and why not check out this conversation that I picked out that acts as the perfect follow-up.